We are going to record this session and welcome everybody. We're so excited to have you join our Friday class all about the principles of the American Revolution. My name is Curry Sautner. I will be here to help and guide you with your questions through the chat and please ask questions. We love questions and we love shares in the chat about the conversation going on. Today is a special, extra special Friday session because we are here with, of course, Jeff Rosen, but also Professor Amar. So without further ado, because I know we have such a short time and so many questions for you, Professor, I'm gonna turn it over to Jeff to kick us off. Thank you so much, Curry, and welcome, Professor Akhil Amar. Friends, I'm so excited to share with you the light and wisdom of Akhil Amar. He was my great teacher in law school, and it was Akhil who inspired my love of the Constitution and all the teaching and learning we're doing together is a result of the sparks that Akhil's brilliant teaching um, lit many years ago. Akhil, welcome back to the National Constitution Center where you're such a frequent friend. And we're here to discuss the principles of the revolution. There's no one who can shed more light on them than you. And I thought it would be illuminating for me and our friends for me to read the crucial um, second paragraph of the Declaration of Independence and just go through those uh, crucial sentences clause by clause and have you elucidate the principles of the American Revolution. So let's begin uh, at the beginning. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. What principle is the Declaration expressing there? Oh, that's such a big one. Um, obviously the deepest is one of human equality. Um, and by man, I think it's very fair to uh, understand that as all human beings, men and women. Uh, and um, there's even now a, a hint um, uh, of uh, uh, the Almighty in that are created equal. Um, you could have just said are born equal, but um, are created um, equal. And that's such a big idea we're still trying to catch up with it. I, I'm not sure they fully understood all the entailments because um, how, how does slavery consist uh, uh, it to be squared with the idea that everyone is, is created equal. It doesn't mean that we're all equally tall or equally strong um, um, or um, um, equally muscular or e e equally um, attractive, um, but um, this deep idea um, of birth equality, which is gonna eventually be the first sentence of the 14th Amendment, everyone born in America is born a citizen, born an equal citizen, um, uh, does have some, I think today we would say all sorts of powerful implications. You're born equal whether you're born, um, uh, uh, well, back in those days, uh, the idea is no one's really born a king um, or born a nobleman, or born um, uh, a, a, a serf. Um, um, uh, there's no divine right of, of kings at, as such. I think today we would take that idea, they would say, well, Englishmen are, are uh, Americans are, are the equal of, of, of Britons in, in England. But today I think we'd say you're born equal, whether you're born black or white, you're born equal, created equal, whether you're born Jew or Gentile, um, whether you're born male or female, whether you're born in wedlock or out of wedlock. Alexander Hamilton very famously is a, a bastard, um, born um, out of wedlock. You're born equal, whether you're first born in your family or fifth born, so no primogeniture and entail laws that should privilege the, the first born in the family over the, the fifth born. I think today, uh, many of us would say, I would say uh, you're, you're born equal whether you're born gay or straight. So, wow, that's a deep, powerful principle that people should be um, judged not by the circumstances of their birth, because um, we're all born equal, but by what, what they do with the opportunities that life gives them. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that. Um, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. What's an unalienable right? So again, we have this idea of the creator and endowed by the creator. Um, and to alienate means to, to, uh, to, to part with, to, to give or to sell. So um, if my uncle gives me um, a, a watch, it's mine now, it's a gift. 
And um, I can alienate that. I can, I can give it to you, um, uh, Jeff, as a, as a sort of a, a, a memento of our, of our many years of, of friendship. I could sell it on um, eBay. Um, uh, so, so there are things that, I, that are mine that I can give away, that I can alienate. But there are some things that I can't alienate even if I want to. I couldn't give away or sell. And I think that the most fundamental um, would be my own freedom of thought. Um, I've been endowed with um, a, a mind, with a brain. And each of us has a, his or her own brain. No, no two people share the same mind or brain, even, even um, uh, uh, siblings, even twins. You and I are both fathers of, of twins, even identical twins. I, you know, your twins and my twins are non-identical, but each of us has uh, our own mind and soul. And that means we, we, we have to be, we, and we can't give that up. We, we have to think for ourselves. Lots of things I can have other people do for me. I can have them um, paint my um, uh, uh, house um, or, um, uh, 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 fix my uh, uh, plumbing um, or um, help uh, or mow my lawn. I, 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 um, they can alienate, give up their labor to some extent and I can give up some of my money and we can make a, uh, a trade. You help me on this and I'll, I'll give you that. Um, but what I can't do is have other people think for me. Um, uh, at the end of the day, I have to decide for myself, for example, what I think is the meaning of life. Um, my relationship to the universe. Um, um, I can't alienate my conscience. I can't really ultimately say, Jeff, you do the thinking for both of us. Even though I, I love you and respect you, at a certain point, I have to do the thinking for myself. That is an unalienable um, uh, right. In some traditions, life itself isn't alien. It's not quite mine to give away. It's a gift from the creator. And, and so I have a duty to preserve it. Um, and, 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 and not just a right, but a duty to think for myself because conscience is inalienable. My thoughts have to be my own. Who's, who else's would they be? That's so crucial what you just told us that if we have certain duties from the creator, uh, we also have rights to perform the duties uh, and, and both the right and the duty are un unalienable because we have to perform it. I, I, I wanted, it's so important that you said that conscience was the quintessential unalienable right. And I want to read from Madison's Memorial and Remonstrance. He says that uh, the religion then of every man must be left to the conviction and conscience of every man. And it is the right of every man to exercise it as these may dictate this right is in its nature and an unalienable right. It is unalienable because the opinions of men, depending only on the evidence contemplated by their own minds, cannot follow the dictates of other men. And then he goes on to reaffirm your point by saying it is unalienable also because what is here a right toward men is a duty toward the creator. So just because this is so important, one more word about Madison's really interesting suggestion that our opinions depend only on evidence contemplated by our own mind, the evidence contemplated by our reasoning minds. To what degree is our, the idea of a reasoning mind itself unalienable? Yeah, um, at, at some deep level, um, you believe what you believe. Um, I, you might be able to force me to do a certain thing. Um, to, to move my arm in a certain way, because if I don't, uh, an electric shock will be administered or something like that. Uh, so, so you might be able to coerce my actions, um, but, but how can you actually, in fact, compel me to hold a certain opinion? Um, you know, um, you can't force people to have the opinions they do, the thoughts they do, the conscience they do. You can try to persuade them. You can, you can try to give them evidence of the world as you understand it, but you can't really force them to, um, to, to think something that they don't think, to believe in some deep, deep way what they don't believe. Fascinating. And we, we know that uh, to be true. Um, and that is why it is self-evident, uh, which is the crucial idea of this whole theory of natural rights that we're exploring. Um, now, you told us why some traditions uh, see life as a unalienable right, because we have a duty to preserve it, because it's a gift from the creator. Why and in what ways is liberty an unalienable right? Um, well, uh, you know, in some ways we do trade things off. Um, I um, give up my 
um, uh, uh, liberty to just lounge around all day um, in exchange for um, maybe showing up at work um, and, uh, and then my employer pays me for the, the um, um, but, but there, there might be again, certain liberties that I can't give up like liberty of thought, liberty of, of, of the mind, liberty of, of, of conscience of being, I think that, so here's Jeff, what we're now agreeing on not all rights are unalienable, maybe even not all kinds of liberty are unalienable, but certain things are. And then we have to figure out what those, what those um, core things are that we, we, we actually can't give up. I, 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 I can't um, sell my votes to you, you know, even if you were willing to pay, you know, and even if I said, you know, like, it doesn't matter that much to me. So here, you know, you give me five dollars, Jeff, and, 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 and you just tell me how to um, a vote. I, 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 there are lots of things where if you give me five dollars, I can give you something. I can give you a, 10 minutes of my time um, um, or um, um, I, 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 can, I, I can give you a book that I wrote or something like that. There are lots of things that I could sell to you for five dollars, but not in the end. Um, my convictions, my beliefs, or for example, my vote. And a vote isn't something that we have in a pure state of nature. Some of the rights that we have are really uh, rights that, that um, uh, 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 emerge after a society um, takes shape. Uh, a right, for example, to, to serve on a jury. They're not juries in, in, uh, before government comes along. They're, they're not elections, they're not votes. So, so lots of the rights that we have actually aren't pure natural rights. They're created by custom, by convention, by laws, by all sorts of systems. Um, um, and, and, and that's true of some liberties and, and, and many rights, but, but not everything. Wonderful. So that reinforces your first point that we, we know that freedom of conscience, freedom of thought is an unalienable liberty, and there might be other unalienable liberties, but um, th there are some liberties that are alienable that we can surrender partial control over in order to get greater security and safety of the rights that we've retained. Um, let's now, uh, we have one more uh, unalienable right on our list, and that's the pursuit of happiness. And you know, Akil, I, I'm now writing a book, you know, inspired by our work together about what Jefferson had in mind when he talked about the pursuit of happiness. And I've learned that he had in mind not, not uh, feeling good, but being good, the pursuit of virtue, of being our best selves, using our powers of reason to master our unreasonable passions and emotions so that we could achieve human flourishing. And I, I've learned that that definition came from the classics from Aristotle, Cicero, great enlightenment thinkers like John Locke and Francis Hutcheson picked it up. Um, do I have that basically right? Is, is that, um, how, how would you say that Jefferson understood the pursuit of happiness? You've taught me something. I, that sounds very persuasive and plausible to me, but I couldn't have said that five minutes ago. Um, our audience should know that although you were very kind uh, to, to say that I was your teacher and technically you were my student, Truthfully, you taught me more than the books that I had read about uh, inalienable rights and, and conscience. You wrote a, a very important paper that you actually published in the Yale Law Journal talking about some of these things. And, and I didn't quite understand them before. The, the first draft was very wide ranging. You talked about Theophilus Parsons and all sorts of documents beyond the Declaration of Independence, George Mason, uh, James Madison, lots of stuff. And it sounded right to me and, um, and you taught me. So what you say sounds right to me, but I actually had never heard that before. I, I know some people have, have emphasized it's not a guarantee of happiness. It's a, a, the ability to pursue happiness and happiness can be elusive. I have said, gee, he is modifying a traditional formulation um, made famous by John Locke and others, a, a, a trilogy that you'll see in many places, Life, Liberty and Property. So I think I had seen my way clear to uh, uh, understanding that, that he is modifying things a little bit. He's not giving us the standard um, Lockean trilogy, life, liberty, and property, but um, uh, what you say makes sense to me, but I think you've researched it more deeply than I. Well, I can't wait to learn with you about this and, and to share with you the, 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 the drafts of the, of the project as I uh, complete it, but yes, um, 
Jefferson was reading Locke, but not the Locke of the second treatise, which talks about life, liberty, and property, but the Locke of the essay concerning human understanding. Yes, uh, Locke is a great empiricist, a great enlightenment figure, a very interesting person in all sorts of ways. Um, uh, uh, one of his famous sentences, it, it was, in the beginning, all the world was America. Um, because mm. He's actually talking about how um, in his um, kind of um, model, um, uh, at the beginning, there's just so much real estate for, for, um, uh, for, for the taking and, and no one really quite owns it all. You, you don't own all that your eye can see um, any more than you own the ocean just because you throw um, a fishing line in there and are trying to fish, um, catch a fish, you don't own the entire ocean. So too, just because you're, you're hunting on a vast um, expanse, you don't own the, the entire continent. So. So um, really interesting sentence, um, very, very famous one of Locke, in the beginning, all the world was America. Um, and that's already imagining a certain America in which actually maybe there aren't a people because there were people living here, Native Americans and, and others, but from a Lockean point of view, did they really own the land unless they mixed their own labor with it, unless they were farmers of a certain sort to who um, plotted the land and bounded it and, 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 and tilled it and, and improved it in various ways and cultivated it. If they were merely hunter gatherers for Locke, they weren't mixing their labor with the land in a way that generated um, a certain kind of property right from his point of view. Oh, so lots of interesting and important um, uh, and, and controversial issues there. All of that is wonderful. And the discussion of the uh, part of Locke that talks about uh, the social contract that you were discuss just discussing in the second treatise leads us to the next sentence that, we, that I wanna ask you about. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Where does that come from and what does it mean? So it is very much um, uh, something that, that comes out of a Lockean tradition. So, so here's where government doesn't derive its power from, for example, the divine right of kings. Uh, King James I of, of England, um, there's also uh, uh, James VI of Scotland and uh, um, the beginning of the, of the um, 1700s, you know, he said, um, I, um, uh, rule by um, just uh, divine right. God ordained me to be the ruler. I'm the sovereign of all. Um, and um, no, the declaration is saying that's actually not where you, um, uh, there's this um, uh, <laughs> famous scene in, in Monty Python um, uh, where um, uh, King Arthur is engaging the um, uh, 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 some folks who say, so well, why, why do you get to tell us what to do? And he says, you know, because the, the lady of the lake, you know, handed me <laughs> Excalibur. Um, um, and, and, and this fellow says, you know, a mandate, to, you know, the right to hold rights are a mandate from the masses, not because some watery tart robbed a scimitar at you. Um, so the consent of the government, it's a very different idea. It's not that some people are born destined to, to, to rule over others, regardless of the interest of the others. The idea is we're all created equal. And if we're all created equal, at some level, we need to agree um, about what the fair rules um, um, uh, of government are. So that's one thing. A second thing that was at the beginning of that sentence, and, and one person at, on the Legal Academy, I think, who's really highlighted this and done some interesting work is Randy Barnett. He's a, he's a libertarian. I know he's um, done things with the National Constitution Center. Um, and he emphasizes very much in much of his work, um, the, the, the preamble of the sentence you just read, that government exists to secure rights. That's the, uh, I'm not sure that's the only purpose of government because I'm not sure that, for example, just uh, building roads and canals, which are very useful for all sorts of purposes so that we can do things together. I'm not sure that's merely to, to secure a right. Government may do things above and beyond um, rights um, securing, just helping us to, to cooperate as, as human beings. But Randy Barnett um, is very much a Neo-Jeffersonian, a Neo-Lockian in his absolute insistence. And I think he's onto something important uh, when he says 
the purpose of government or a main purpose of government is to make sure that these rights are secure to implement them. That's so interesting. And that um, you mentioned the Essex results that we talked about um, m many years ago. And uh, it was the written by Parsons. Yeah. And he gives a kind of more thorough definition about how, what kind of rights we surrender to government and why. So I'm going to read it again to see if we think it's relevant. He says, um, all men are born equally free. The rights they possess at their birth are equal and of the same kind. Some of those rights are alienable and may be parted with for an equivalent. Others are unalienable and inherent and of that importance that no equivalent can be received for the exchange. Those rights that are unalienable and of that importance are called the right of conscience. Um, so that, that kind of helped me understand why we surrender the rights to government. We have to get something back, the equivalent, and the equivalent is greater security and safety of the rights we've retained. And that helps me understand what you just explained about that sentence, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. Do, do, is, that, is that basically right? Yeah. And I did learn some of that from, from your paper way back when. Um, our next sentence is that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of those ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. You have cast so much light on that central clause. What does it mean? Uh, that's very much an idea that Locke um, uh, elaborates uh, in this um, as, in his set of writings, two treatises of government, that um, um, uh, when government becomes tyrannical, uh, it's the right of the people. Jefferson goes even further and says it's the duty of the people to cast off this uh, tyrannous yoke um, and to try to um, uh, create a new government um, that will um, better serve the core purposes of government, uh, central of which um, is the securing of rights. So the rest of the declaration is going to be um, an indictment of the King of England and his buddies in, in parliament saying, um, here's a list of all the things that the king has done, sometimes on his own, sometimes with people in parliament that are tyrannical, that are violations of our rights as we understand them. And that's why it's permissible for us to, to renounce all allegiance to him because the, the, the deal was he was gonna protect our rights and in exchange for his protection of our rights, we owed him allegiance. Um, we were gonna be loyal subjects. But now, um, when the, whenever, and the, the phrase that's used is a long train of abuses, which actually comes directly from Locke, um, when, when if we can show that again and again, again, not just once, but um, uh, just uh, repeatedly and systematically, he keeps uh, disregarding our rights, invading them, um, uh, uh, threatening them, it's our um, uh, right, our duty to uh, basically to shed our allegiance and, and try to create a better system um, that will better serve um, our uh, uh, rights. Um, that, and and the, we're gonna wanna consent to that new and better system. Wow, well, now I understand why the right of, the right to alter and abolish government understood as the right of revolution against a tyrannical government would be an unalienable right. Is it limited to a right of revolution or does it include a, the right of say constitutional amendment as well? Well, Americans go beyond the declaration over the next 20 years. Um, and the, the declaration is just trying to justify revolting actually in a military way. It's gonna come down to, to fighting um, uh, against a, a, a tyrannical government. Uh, later on, people like James Wilson, um, uh, who um, uh, has strong connections to um, Philadelphia. He's one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. He'll be one of only six people to sign the Declaration and the Constitution, along with the likes of, 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 of Ben Franklin, Roger Sherman, 
um, and, um, uh, uh, and others. Um, uh, James Wilson, whose statue is in the National Constitution Center in Signers Hall, at, um, uh, um, uh, James Wilson is gonna come along and say, we've actually tamed, domesticated a right of revolution. We don't need to appeal to arms anymore to effectuate it. We can just have constitutional amendments and we can amend the constitution, not merely because government has acted tyrannically, but just because we think actually we've got a better idea. Government right now is okay, but we have a better idea and we should be able to implement that idea through a constitutional amendment, which doesn't require um, um, appeal to arms. And because it doesn't require appeal to arms, um, the, the, the trigger for it, the threshold can be um, even uh, gentler. It doesn't, um, we don't need to prove that there's tyranny. We just, uh, um, the, a long train of abuses, we just need to say, hey, um, it's okay now. Here's something that would be even better. Let's put it to a, a, a vote in a constitutional amendment process that again, to repeat, doesn't require appeal to arms, but just merely free and fair elections and sound rules for um, constitutional amendment, um, democratic rules, voting rules. Fascinating. So democratic rules, voting rules, the rule of law themselves would be implicit in this unalienable right to alter and abolish government. Is that, is that right? Well, and we're moving beyond violent revolution. The declaration is sort of early in this process. And what does it lead to? So declaration is negative in a way. It's casting off the king's power and England's power, but it immediately leads to affirmative things. In each state, uh, the colonies are, each colony is now a new state, a free and independent state. Um, 11 of them are gonna adopt state constitutions. They're gonna basically create their own governments. Um, and once they start to do that, they learn additional things and they, they practice self-government. And by the time of 1787, 88, where there's another conclave in Philadelphia, not to um, sign a declaration of independence, but to draft a constitution, um, Americans have actually moved beyond the declaration, beyond law in some ways, beyond merely um, a right of violent revolution, but rather um, just a more full-blown idea that the people can modify their constitutions basically at any time and for any reason that they deem a good and sufficient, they think would be just better than the regime that they have, but they're gonna be able to do it peacefully through um, elections rather than um, by um, uh, uh, warfare, which is what the, the declaration is basically get, getting Americans ready to, to, to continue a war that in fact has already started. Um, Lexington and Concord were um, April of 1775. Um, um, and, uh, uh, and then you, you, we have Bunker Hill in, in, in June of, of 17. The, the fighting war is already a year old um, by the time the Declaration of Independence comes along. But later on, we're gonna have this idea, hey, to change our uh, regime, we don't need to fight wars. We, we just need to have good, fair votes with free speech and, and, and voting equality. Wow, well, thank you so much for helping us begin down the path from the Declaration to the Constitution and identifying that basic idea, of free and fair elections rooted in popular sovereignty as a core principle that emerged from the Declaration and undergirded the Constitution. Okay, Akhil, here's what I'm, I want to ask you to do something really important now. And I haven't uh, shared you with this in advance, so I'm going to give you a moment to think um, by reading to you the three principles that Curry has put in the chat box that in, in the past with our friends in this class, we've distilled from the Declaration and said that these are the principles of the revolution that undergird the Declaration and the Constitution. I'll read the three principles we came up with, and then I want you to give you, our friends, your, um, your, your light and your reflection on, on what you, which three principles you would choose. Um, so here, here, here are the ones that we have in the chat box. Popular sovereignty, which is the idea that the most legitimate form of government is driven by the people. Natural rights, the, the idea that rights are given by God or nature and not uh, from government and are inherent in all human beings at birth. And the rule of law, the basic idea that we have a government of law and not of men or arbitrary rule. So we identified popular sovereignty, natural rights, and the rule of law. Uh, would you choose those three principles or would you have a different list? I think that's a good list, a um, great list. I, I'd say um, these are not merely principles of the Declaration of Independence, 
I'd want us to bring the Constitution into the picture, um, and uh, which is 11 years, uh, 12 years later. Um, and I want to and I want to remind people it's not just ideas and words, but actually deeds um, and experiences and um, uh, events. Um, so what's on the um, the front of the National Constitution Center? Um, the preamble, um, and the preamble isn't just a text. Um, it's actually describing something that's done. Let me pull out all the reasons. We, the people, dot, 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 do ordain and establish. Here's the point. The Constitution was actually put to a vote up and down the continent. That's popular sovereignty. The Declaration wasn't put to uh, some special vote. Uniquely in the history of the world, Americans in up and down an entire continent in 1787, 88, put the thing to a vote. That's popular sovereignty. That had never before happened in world history. Massachusetts had put their constitution to a vote in 1780 and, and New Hampshire in 1784, but ne never had a continent done it. And by the way, the ancient democracies, there were very many of them, but they never put things to um, constitutions to a vote. Um, one man, the lawgiver, hands the law down from on high, kind of like Moses on Sinai or Solon, um, the lawgiver in ancient Athens. So the, even the ancient democracies didn't ever put their constitutions to a vote. We did. That's popular sovereignty. More people were allowed to vote on the constitution than had ever been allowed to vote for anything um, else in human history, how they and their posterity would govern. That's popular sovereignty. And the declaration moves in that direction when it talks about consent of the governed, but it's throwing off a government. It's not building a new one affirmatively. And it's doing, um, declaration is, is envisioning a war. Constitution is utterly peaceful, um, not a shot fired. Um, the, the losers um, cheer, acquiesce. They, they say, well, we were outvoted um, fair and square. They don't storm the Capitol. Wow, wow, wow. That's not so much the declaration, which isn't put to a vote and which leads to a shoot in war, but the Constitution. So yes, popular sovereignty. Yes, natural rights, but I'll see you natural rights and raise you because those aren't the only rights we have. Voting rights aren't in a state of nature. Uh, rights to be tried by a jury or to participate in a jury. There are all sorts of other rights above and beyond the ones that the, the small number that, that we can deduce um, from, from nature. So natural rights, yes, and other rights. Um, and yes, of course, the constitution is um, it describes itself um, as the supreme law of the land. It's law. And so it has to be animated by an idea, um, most importantly, of the rule of law, which we haven't talked about in great detail, but it, it's a very deep principle. And it's as opposed to the rule of one person or set of persons, as opposed to whim or will. Um, it's actually about um, um, reason and consent. Um, it's a very, very deep idea that um, has gone through um, different iterations over, over the centuries. But um, I think those are three great ones. I just want to remind you for each one, we got to go beyond the declaration um, to the constitution, which is the embodiment, the actual implementation of popular sovereignty, which itself is law in a way that the declaration is not um, uh, quite, um, and is affirming all sorts of rights and not merely um, natural rights, but for example, rights to a jury trial, which are very much kind of rights of, within a governmental system. That's so important to uh, remind us that uh, these are the principles of not only the revolution, but the constitution, and they're perfected in the constitution with its popular ratification, its recognition of rights beyond natural rights, and its uh, embodiment of the supremacy of the rule of law rather than whim. J just uh, before we leave this question of trying to distill the principles, are there any principles of the Declaration and Constitution you would add to our list of three, or would you kind of encapsulate the whole I American idea in a different way, if, you, if I asked you to do it in a paragraph or so? I just remind us that even with the constitution, the thing was deeply flawed because we weren't really living it out until much, much later in the story. Slavery isn't gonna be eliminated until the 1860s. Um, women aren't gonna get the vote and blacks aren't gonna get the vote everywhere in America, black, uh, e equally um, black men at least until um, after the civil war, women aren't gonna get an equal suffrage until the 20th century with the 19th amendment across the board. Only in my lifetime do 18 year olds, young adults get to participate equally in the political process. That was an amendment added um, in, in 
my lifetime and abolition of poll tax disfranchisement, we're still trying to catch up to some of these ideas. You know, Jeff, when you and I met, um, uh, two men couldn't get married to each other and, and pursue their happiness and their virtue, even if they deeply loved each other or two women. You know, that, that, when you and I met, that was not legal anywhere in America. Um, and today it's legal everywhere in America because we really are created equal, gay or straight, I would say. And we really do have a right to pursue um, happiness. Um, and so we're, we're still trying to catch up to some of the, the, the implications of some of these really, really deep, profound um, ideas that are, that are being articulated. Oh, that is so true and so crucially important to remember. Um, Curry, I'm learning so much from Akil as always. I'm, and our friends in the chat box are chatting the preamble. And do we have time to ask Akil to go through the preamble? I would just love to take that uh, clause by clause if we could, but I understand that um, uh, maybe that's too much to ask of Akil. Curry, Curry can, I, can I do that? Go through the sure, preamble? Sure, So, And we did the first sentence in the last, or the first three words in the last few words already. Um, so why not keep breaking it up? I love color coding it for the students too, so they can see which part is in there. So Akil, if you're cool with that, I'm sure. cool with that. Sure. So <laughs> well, um, um, let me do one thing, um, the, the, maybe the, the most important thing, I, it's, it's very tacky. Uh, I apologize in advance, but, but we're talking about big ideas. We don't have a lot of time. So I'm gonna be straight with you. If you really are serious about these ideas, you, you can't learn it all in half an hour. You actually have to read and you have to read um, books. And I've been seeing people in the chats talking about books. I don't know some of those books. I'm going to be straight with you. I'm, I'm, I'm almost straight. Um, I think in my books, you will find um, um, elaborations of these, the two um, most of all, um, and they grow out of my relationship to the National Constitution Center, are a book called America's Constitutional Biography, the first chapter of which is just the preamble. Um, it's 50 pages on, on the preamble. And the words that made us actually tells you in a much more detailed way, the story of how we actually did up and down the continent state by state ordain and establish the thing. So I can't really just give you all of, of that. That's a whole chapter of the book. That's chapter five of this book. It's called um, People, um, excuse me, chapter six called People. Um, so, but just in a nutshell, so, so honestly, I, I know some people were, were talking about books in the chat and all the rest, and if those books are so great, you should have their authors um, here. Um, uh, but I, I know that I actually um, learned from Jeff, and what I learned from Jeff, I put into these books, but I learned from my other students, I put in these books, and I can't summarize everything in just a few seconds. I hope, you don't have to buy the book, you have to read it. It'll take you a long time to read because there's a lot of stuff there. These are deep, deep ideas that are world transformative, but in a nutshell. No, wait, yeah. Akil, let, let me just stop and reinforce what you just said. First, friends, I want to show Akil's book, which you can see I literally have at my side, the same book that he just showed you, and I want you to do what he just uh, suggested and read this book. And as Akil said, it's long and you won't be able to read it quickly and you won't be able to, uh, you may have to uh, really focus, but it's crucially important. And the most important thing that both Akil and I can urge you to do is the importance of deep reading. And you'll see behind me uh, on my screen here, this, the most precious possession I own, which is this um, legend that my grandfather, who I never met, uh, made with his own hands. And it says, the fountain of wisdom flows through books. And those beautiful words were inscribed in the Detroit Public Library. And he, during the depression in the 1920s, saw it and carved it with his own hands to pass on to his son, my, my dad, uh, who passed those values on to me. And they were uh, just as Akil's parents passed them on to him. And that's what we're trying to do to you. So it's, um, it's a superpower if you will take the time to read great books like Akil's, and the only way to grow in wisdom is to tap into that fountain of wisdom, which flows through books. So recognizing that and urging you to read Akil's book, which is your homework for the class, let's go through the preamble. And I know we taught, we did read the first words, but let's uh, start again. We the yeah. people, it's. Yeah, so um, sub, uh, they used to say uh, back when he was a little more respectable that when Rudy Giuliani, who was running for president, every sentence in his campaign um, uh, uh, tour featured a, a noun, a verb, and 9-11. Um, so um, a, a noun and a verb is we the people is the subject noun, 
do, that's the verb, or ordain and establish, we're doing something, and what's the object? A constitution. So noun, verb, and actually direct object. We are ordaining a constitution. That's the most important one. The people are doing it. They're voting on it. They're talking about it. They're deliberating on it. People are opposing it, and they're allowed to oppose it. There's freedom of speech and debate in this process. It's epic. It takes a whole year. Nothing like this ever had happened in the history of the world and the world would never be the same. I call that the big bang in world history. A whole year, a whole continent, not just um, um, uh, voting on a constitution, but talking about it, deliberating about it in state after state after state. We, the people, do ordain and establish a constitution for ourselves and our posterity. We're doing, this is, we understand this is not just for us, but we're launching a whole system and what we do Later generations can do themselves. They can amend and they have, they've made amends for some of the mistakes that, that, that we've made like slavery, for example. So it's not just one year, one, one, one person, one vote, you know, one time, one year. It's beginning a project of um, intergenerational constitutional governance that will change the history of the world. So that's, the, and they tell us six reasons why they do it. Blessings of liberty is really important. That's this idea. We, we create government to secure these rights. Okay, so that, that harkens back. But the other biggest thing, because I'm not going to go through every single one, but the other biggest thing is common. Oh, well, general welfare is not just about rights. It's maybe about roads and canals and safety. Not everything that government does necessarily is perhaps just about protecting rights. Sometimes it's just helping us to, to do things uh, better as a, as a nation than we could do it as individuals. Final thing I want to just tell you is common defense is really important because the threats to America at the time were from these foreign monarchs who, who actually didn't believe in the consent of the governed. And, and yes, some of them had helped us in the revolution, like France, but we had but George Washington and Ben Franklin had fought against them in what we call the French and Indian War, the Seven Years War um, in the 1750s. And, and in the future, who knows whether they're going to, France is going to keep supporting us or not, or Spain, which is a monarchy, or um, um, uh, 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 Britain, which is a monarchy, um, uh, or Russia, or um, um, uh, all sorts of autocrats in modern day Germany. Back then it was Prussia. So, um, the Constitution is fundamentally um, a common defense project championed by George Washington, um, who um, uh, wa uh, um, was the, the, the commanding general who was able to, to preserve our liberty by defeating King George. Um, uh, and, and then when he had all power at his command, he had the only army on the continent, he gives it up surrenders his commission, surrenders the sword to go back to his plow, to live under laws that his fellow citizens have made. That's why we can trust him to be our, our first president. He's the presiding officer, the president at the Philadelphia Convention. He towers over everyone in Signers Hall and National Constitution Center. When you go there, you'll just see, literally, he's sort of head and shoulders above almost everyone else, maybe not Governor Morris, but definitely little Jimmy Madison. Um, so we, the people, do ordain a constitution. We're doing this thing with free speech and free votes for ourselves and our posterity up and down the continent. We're doing it to secure the blessings of liberty, to secure liberty for the general welfare. But those are all secured in part by common defense. We have to hang together as a nation and we have to do so today. You see, even though you know, we're red and blue and, and coastal and, and, and heartland, there are divisions in America, but if we don't hang together, God help the world actually, because we are an amazing model of an entire continental people that actually is trying to live out certain principles of the Declaration of the Constitution and work together to show that Jews and Catholics and whites and blacks you know, and, and Gentiles and, and, and I mean, Jews and Catholics and Protestants and, and Buddhists and, and Muslims, people of different re religions, different races, some people who, whose family came over yesterday on a boat, other people that descend from the Mayflower, we actually are a people. And we believe in certain things together, like the Declaration there, the American Creed. We can all be part of that project. Um, and, 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 and if we don't hold together, and common defense is a, is a big part of that, the world will lose its last 
best hope, which is this idea that, because there are other democracies in, in the world, but none of them are multicultural, truly the way modern America um, is. And, and that wasn't fully at the founding. It was a little bit at the founding, but then it got better after the civil war and into the 20th century. That's what we have to preserve today. And it's, it's what the preamble says. That's so inspiring, Keel. And at the end of that completely dazzling encapsulation of the preamble, you told us about the last three of the purposes or objects or means of, of, uh, of uh, establishing the blessings of, of liberty, which was uh, promoting the general welfare and promoting the common defense all by creating this common uh, uh, welfare pact. But I, I wanna ask you about the first three, which you kind of signaled um, at the end, uh, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice and ensure domestic tranquility. Help, why did they choose those particular words and, and, and what do they have in mind? Well, a, a more perfect union means it's gonna be indivisible, no secession. Because the Declaration of Independence is 13 free and independent states. They're independent even of each other and you can have a Brexit. And, um, and, and, but, but, and, 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 but 11 years later, there's a realization, no, actually we can't allow a Brexit, one state to go off or another state because suppose it goes off and one state allies with Britain and another one allies with Spain and another one allies with France. Now we've got all the European conflicts here on American soil um, um, and, and, and that will carve America up. So, so it has to be a more perfect union than the Articles of Confederation. It has to be an indivisible union. What, what, uh, uh, but, uh, and, and so that's what a more, per it's gonna be a union like the Union of Scotland and England to create kind of a, 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 um, a, a regime in which we won't need a big army because we won't have internal land borders um, and armies threaten liberty. Um, all we are gonna, we're gonna actually not mess with the rest of the world. Uh, we're not imagining getting involved in land wars in Europe or Asia. We, we're just gonna try to make this continent work. That's a, a perfect union that's indivisible. Um, a domestic uh, tranquility, we wanna avoid um, convulsions and, um, and, and, and uh, um, insurrections like Shays' Rebellion. We, we need to have a, a strong enough system to avoid these domestic tumults. And yes, it is about justice and, and, and fairness and, and, and rights and the rule of law. So, so you see how the preamble is a beautiful codification of many of the things that we've been talking about, popular sovereignty, the rule of law, um, uh, um, uh, uh, rights, um, um, it's all there. Wow. And I think the only uh, sentence I, we have to parse uh, one last time is the first. Um, uh, it, it says, we the people of the United States, but as, as you taught me, and as we can see at the National Constitution Center, where we have James Wilson's earliest drafts, the, and an even earlier draft said, we the people of the states of uh, New Hampshire, Rhode Island and Providence Plantation and so forth. Why did uh, they change the language from we the people of the states of to we the people of the United States? Well, we can't be entirely sure, but this idea of united is really important. Ben Franklin originates the world's first viral meme, the world's first cartoon. It's called Join or Die. It's very famous. You've seen it everywhere. Before that, there weren't cartoons, political cartoons, but he's in a democratic society. He's trying to make appeals to fellow citizens. So um, he's so amazing, the, the, the Franklin stove, uh, bifocals, the lightning rod, but a political cartoon making a strong statement join or die in other versions that's going to become unite or die so the states have to be united now the united states and the declaration talks about um, the united colonies if you had named each one by name it's going to be a little awkward because suppose all 13 don't ratify the last sentence of the constitution article 7 says any nine will do and if we had listed all 13, it might be a little awkward because actually when George Washington takes his oath of office as first president of the United States, Rhode Island hasn't said yes yet. In fact, North Carolina hasn't said yes um, either. So we don't know all the reasons why. I think it soars more. Um, I think it really captures right at the very beginning this idea of, of unity, e pluribus unum. We are one and indissoluble. 
Um, but also, if you named all the 13, it would be a little awkward if Rhode Island, you know, basically um, said thanks, but no thanks, um, um, uh, and did so enduringly. In fact, um, they, they rejoined very shortly after George Washington's inauguration. Wonderful. Akhil, I cannot imagine a greater privilege than walking through with you the precious words of the Declaration and the Preamble to the Constitution. Um, so thank you for that uh, gift to all of our students. And uh, although I'm always reluctant to do this, now is the time for me to turn the uh, Zoom back over to Curry for a few questions from our friends before we break. And really, we, we, I know we need to wrap up because our students need to jump, but that was unbelievably important and interesting. One question that goes along with that, this Big Bang moment, and our students were asking about it. If you had to parse out the Big Bang moment of the revolution and wanted to look at that Big Bang moment leading up to the revolution, kind of a mini Big Bang, is there, would it be Boston Tea Party? Would it be the Boston Massacre? Kind of what was that? There's so many pieces that within 15 years, we go from loving the king to fully the biggest breakup in world history. Um, so what are, there's all these pieces matter, but would there be one that you could really right. rally them around studying? So, thanks. So for me, the most important thing isn't even the declaration because it's not put to a vote. The most important thing is the constitution. That's why it's the National Constitution Center, not just the National Declaration Center, because we put the thing to a vote and really talked about it. And it's not the fault of the folks in 1776 that that didn't happen. They were already in the middle of a shooting war. So it was just gonna be very difficult uh, to, to have that kind of, um, so, so how amazing is it that in 1787, 88, the wars have stopped. There isn't any army bru um, uh, 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 overawing America, and you, but there's gonna be a war sometime down the line that welcome to the world. And they took this little moment of peace and pros relative peace and prosperity and used it to really talk amongst themselves, think among themselves and come up with a system that would actually work going forward. That's what's most amazing is they put the thing to a vote with epic free speech. So the biggest bang is 1787-88, the constitution. What led up to it? Well, of course you can't get to that without the declaration. What led to it? You're absolutely right, Curry. None of my early books started my story early enough. My book on um, uh, America's constitution started with the preamble, started with 1787 and everything else, uh, the ordainment was backstory like the Declaration of Independence. The new book, the Declaration isn't actually even chapter one. I start much earlier because I start in 1760. Everyone seems to be happy um, um, as, as, as Britons in America. In 1760, it's all hunky-dory. They're toasting their new king in Boston, raising their um, uh, glasses of ale in the um, inns and ale houses. So, you know, and in, and in 15 years, it's all gonna unravel. They're saying, God saved the king in 1761, James Otis and, and John Adams. They're, they're all cheering that their new young king. And 15 years later, they're saying he's a tyrant and, um, uh, and we have to overthrow him by force of arms. Um, so that's chapter one and two of the new book. And I've never told that story before. They're interesting cast of characters. Um, I think the biggest pivot point is when the Bostonians stage um, a kind of political theater um, uh, called the Boston Tea Party, that they're saying, we, you know, this really isn't, we don't like this, You're, you keep taxing us. Um, and the British react to what was ultimately peaceful. It was a little provocative, but it wasn't a storming of the Capitol. It, it wasn't um, actually, it, no one died, no one came close to dying. It was you know, peaceful, nonviolent political protest. Um, um, yes, uh, uh, a few hundred um, uh, uh, casts of tea were thrown overboard, but, but, but um, in part because the Brits weren't listening um, and Americans couldn't vote. Um, so they were trying to get the Brits' attention. Instead of talking to Americans and continuing a conversation, the Brits react in 1774 with a set of laws, they call them the coercive acts. They're proud, they say, we're coercing you. You know, Americans call them the intolerable acts that try to shut down the port of Boston, that abrogate the charter of, of Massachusetts, that um, um, uh, uh, basically deprive Americans going forward of jury trial, that try to shut down local town meetings, trying to basically shut down political discourse and punish Americans for basically petitioning and speaking out. 
That's the turning point. Coercive Acts of 17, um, se um, uh, 74, and there's going to be it's going to be very quick path from that to Lexington and Concord and Bunker Hill and George Washington as head of a Continental Army and the Declaration of Independence and a, and a shooting war. And in a nutshell, Britain loses America because the Brits aren't listening. They're not reading American newspapers. Uh, Jeff, after he graduated um, as my student, you know, was, um, spent many years in, uh, as an as a amazing journalist. America's constitution grows up alongside American newspapers. And Americans are beginning to talk to each other, Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Charleston, joining, uniting, um, and the Brits aren't listening. They're trying to shut down discourse. They try to pr uh, uh, prohibit uh, petitions and all the rest. And that is going to lead. And so we didn't talk about actually one other sentence, Jeff, of the declaration, in which at the very end of this list, he says, you know, after all of these things, we keep petitioning we, and, and, and our petitions aren't being listened to. So if they're not listening to you, what else can you do? That actually was the last straw that because because Americans had been they kept trying to basically appeal to the king to parliament here are grievances talk to us we can maybe come up with a solution together and George the third never read American newspapers here's an aha fact and this is all in the new book I didn't know this stuff before the new one because the other book started too late they started in 1787 now I'm starting in 1760. Ben Franklin, I told you what an amazing guy he is. He's in Signers Hall too. Again, when six people to sign the Declaration and the Constitution with James Wilson, um, um, uh, actually um, George Washington isn't one of the six because he was off um, fighting for our liberty when the Declaration is, is signed. Ben Franklin in the 1760s and 1770s, late 1760s, early 1770s, he's in Britain for 10 years. He's one of the greatest figures in the world. Today, he'd be a Nobel laureate. He's one of the most famous scientists in the world, probably the most famous New Worlder. You know, and he's done all these amazing things, but he's low born. He's, um, he's one of 17 children um, and his father is a candle maker, okay? So he's not upper class. He's in London for 10 years and George III can't ever be bothered to ask him for a cup of tea. You know, he's the, he's the greatest New Worlder in, um, uh, in existence, and George III isn't interested. He's not interested in listening to his low-born American subjects. He's not reading newspapers. Who's frankly, he's a newspaper man. He's a printer. He, he's not conversing. They try to shut down conversation with the course of acts. That's actually um, the, the, the uh, oh, um, I will respond to him in just a minute. But um, uh, Jeff, you see that our mutual friend Neil is apparently uh, 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 calling me. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we will let you go. That was fantastic. That's actually one of my ben favorite Ben Franklin stories is just how he, his energy towards Britain turns as well. And then being basically scolded by parliament. And he's like, I'm out, we're done. We're not going to make this up. But what he is, so, he is so loyal at the beginning of my yeah. story. Um, and he's, he's uh, demeaned, he's um, uh, mistreated, he's mocked, he's ridiculed. Uh, a British class structure treats him as dirt um, and, and a British king um, can't be bothered to, to even meet yep. him. And what an unbelievable like, life lesson to apply to all relationships. You need to start by listening. And that is fantastic for civil discourse, constitutional discourse, or in general, life. So thank you so much, Akil. This has been such a privilege and so much fun. I feel like it's our revolutionary movie theater going on today. So thank you, Akil. Thank you, Jeff. And students, have a wonderful day. Thank you so much, Akil. That was so meaningful. Uh, say hi to Neil and, and we'll talk soon. Okay, bye. Bye.